All right. <clears throat> Welcome back to Racial and Ethnic Minorities. Um, this lecture is for the week of February 7th through the 11th. And so everything that we talk about uh, is for that week. Uh, we're actually going, going to be discussing critical race theory, intersectionality, as well as what you see in your um, syllabus, language, and the power of language, uh, Native Americans, etc. So we'll be going over all of that this week. I decided <clears throat> to add critical race theory in there for this week because of what is happening in the news. Um, there are some additional, um, there are some additional uh, conversations and discussions around particularly around critical race theory that I think are important. And I was gonna talk about it later on in the semester, but I figured I would speed it up and talk about it today um, because of these larger discussions that are happening in the state of Florida. So that is why you're gonna get this kind of extra lecture and extra conversation uh, around critical race theory. Um, so we are going to uh, talk about that, and then we're also going to talk about um, talk about what we have, the power of language, uh, which is outlined in your syllabus. So with that being said, um, I want you to tell me, what do people believe critical race theory is? What do you think people believe critical race theory is? And just kind of think about that for a second. You can pause the video and um, or just kind of tell me based on what you've heard, um, based on the various discussions, what do people believe critical race theory is? Now, after you think about that, what is critical race theory? Um, I want you to click on this link and I want you to watch this link that kind of explains people's varying views on critical race theory and how think about how that aligns with what you think people believe critical race theory is so do that and then we will come back to <clears throat> the uh the lecture generally i like to 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 show it in the lecture and share it but then when I try to upload it to YouTube, it blocks it. So I end up having to take it out anyway. So that's why I just have to uh, trust that you'll click the link. So go ahead and do that and then come back and then we'll discuss further. <clears throat> okay. So now that you've come back and you've um, watched this video and thought about how that video relates to what you believe that people think um, about critical race theory. Can you tell me what it is? Um, can you think about what it is? And before we start to break down what critical race theory is, it's a couple of things that we need to make sure we understand what it is not saying. Um, there are a lot of assumptions that are made within critical race theory. Right, there are a lot of things that we think it says. One of the things that we think critical, or people, a lot of times what people think critical race theory is saying, that it is not saying, is that white people are evil, right? A lot of times um, people think that critical race theory is saying white people are bad, white people are evil, all of these negative, descriptions towards white people or the white race in general, right? That is not what critical race theory is saying. There may be other theories or other ideas or other people that may adopt this line of thinking, may have these feelings or may have these descriptions that they attribute to white people or the white race um, that does exist, However, critical race theory is not one of those theories. It's not one of those concepts. So critical race theory is not an anti-white or um, um, an anti-white or a racist theory 
or a reverse racist theory towards white people. Um, critical race theory, uh, it is not saying that minorities should oppress other groups. Many people believe that critical race theory is, again, is a reverse racist idea. And it is a way of saying that it is okay now for minority groups to come down and oppress white people or oppress other groups of people to get revenge, if you will. Um, so critical race theory is this kind of way of leading this idea that minority groups will um, get revenge on anybody who's ever oppressed them. Uh, it is not saying that a person should hate America. Many people believe that critical race theory suggests that people uh, uh, should hate America. It is not an anti-America speech. It is not anti-America discussions. It, it does not promote anti-America rhetoric. Um, many people believe that critical race theory um, um, is anti-nationalism or anti being proud of where you're from. Critical race theory is not that. It was not put in place to make people feel or to suggest that a person should hate the United States or hate uh, any other country that is traditionally European or is controlled by European principles or people who um, whose descendants are from Europe. So critical race theory is not in any way attacking a country or even a continent. And lastly, uh, critical race theory is not saying that white people should hate themselves. Some many people believe that critical race theory is put in place to make white people feel guilty. And white people should hate who they are and hate their skin or hate their country or hate their people. It is not put in place to suggest that a person should hate who they are regardless of their race, regardless of where they are from, regardless of um, what their ancestors have been through or have done. Critical race theory is not put in place to say that a person should look at themselves and not like what they see in the mirror. Um, it is not put in place to say that a person should hate their ancestors or hate their history. Um, essentially, what critical race theory is, it's overall, and, and, and if you listen to what Kimberly Crenshaw says, uh, Kimberly Crenshaw is one of the progenitors of critical race theory, and we'll talk about the history of it in a second, but the critical race theory is really just an attack on uh, on the response to the Black Lives Matter protests last summer. Um, let me see, let me make sure. <clears throat> so yeah, it is the attack on the Black Lives Matter protests last summer. Um, as we know, uh, during, particularly during the 2020 summer, um, George Floyd at the early part of the summer was murdered uh, by Derek Chauvin as other police officers watched on uh, in Minnesota. And this sparked major protests around the nation and around the world. And this reignited the Black Lives Matter movement and the Black Lives Matter protests that have been going on for almost a decade now. So this reignited those protests and it sent shockwaves, I think, throughout the country because initially in the Black Lives Matter protests, uh, you know, you all were probably very young, that I was a part of in the early part of the 2010s, maybe 20, uh, you know, around 2011, 2012, 
um, it was mostly black people at those protests. It was very, very rare. I mean, you might say a few white people, but it was mostly black people. Then again, I mean, I was in a, an, in a predominantly black city at the time, um, but you would rarely see white people. And then even on TV, when they would, um, you know, do reports on these protests, it was usually black people at those protests. They, they were popular. Everybody was talking about it. it was on CNN, ABC, everywhere. But, and it was big, but it didn't quite have the impact that it's having now. Now, typically when you go, a lot of times when you go to these protests, it's very multiracial. Um, there are a lot of white participants out now. There are a lot of white, there are some white allies that may come to the protest that may march as a way of protesting the killing and the murders unlawfully of by police officers on um, on U.S. citizens, more specifically on Black people. And so, because it has been very uh, popular now, had yeah, the Black Lives Matter protests have become very popular now, and it is starting to catch on to the younger white generation. Um, people are really starting to see its popularity, its growth, its impact. And I think that definitely led to the guilty verdict that was sent for Derek Chauvin in his murder, you know, in the murder of George Floyd. And so people are starting to see, particularly politicians, maybe people who are a bit more conservative, are starting to see that there's this shift happening socially. And where is this shift coming from? Where is the thinking coming from? What are, what are the philosophies being taught that are shaping not only black students, not only students of color, but also these young white students, this new white generation, what is being taught to them that is making them become a part of this movement? What's happening? And one of the things that has now been uh, uncovered and unearthed is that white people are starting to learn and know more popularly critical race theory. One of the theories, right? There are a lot of different theories around race and there are a lot of different perspectives from people when you come to college, you take classes on race, things like that. One of the things many of these people in these groups found was that there was this thing called critical race theory. Now, critical race theory has been around since the 80s, right? It's not new. Well, like maybe like, yeah, like 70s, 1970s, 1980s. It's not new. But this was the thing, this is what Kimberly Crenshaw says that, and Kimberly Crenshaw is a, is a UCLA law professor and, you know, a uh, uh, scholar. I know I mentioned her, but I didn't say who she was. She was one of the people who started critical race theory, right? Uh, her, Derek Bell, we'll talk more about it. Her, Derek Bell, who was uh, President Obama's former law professor, all of these people were the people that came together and formed critical race theory. So um, this is what they chose to attack. Well, this is what our kids are learning. What is this about? They're teaching white hate, or they're or they're 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 promoting white hate. They're teaching um, hatred for America in these theories and in these kind. And this is what's making our kids, uh, particularly white students, not love themselves. Teaching them to hate themselves. Teaching them to hate America because they're bringing up all of these things, all of these ways in which. Uh, um, 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 America has, has oppressed other groups and they're forcing this on our kids and they're forcing them to hate who they are. And really what this is, is really just an attack using critical race theory as the catalyst for a larger attack on the victories that have come out of the Black Lives Matter protests. And so, I don't think that had it not been for these protests and the success of the protests, particularly the the um, the conviction of Derek Chauvin, I don't think mo most people would care about critical race theory. Because, again, it's been in existence for a long time, 40, 
40, 50 years now. And this is the first time it's been so just plastered all over the place. It's so popular. It's this, you know, big ticket political item that I've never known it to be that big of an issue in the past. So it reminds me of something that one of my um, one of my um, professors from uh, she was a professor of mine in undergrad. She taught me her name was Dr. Ifama Kwesi. And she's still today a mentor of mine. And she told me one day, um, or she said this in, in, in a lecture one day, and I always remembered it. Um, you can't be an uncritical lover, nor can you be an unloving critic of something that you care about. Now, she got it from somebody else. I can't remember who the first person was, but I got it from her. So that's why I'm, I'm giving her that, that um, uh, the citation or the credit. But if you care about something, you can't be an uncritical lover of it, nor can you be an unloving critic. <clears throat> now, she was talking about, this is a religion class, so she was talking about church and that sort of thing. But this can also be applied to a larger, uh, this has a larger meaning. Anything that you care about, you have to criticize it. Anything that you, you, you want to see do better, you have to critique it. Some of you may have children, some of you may not, but if you do, one of the things that you have to do as a parent is you have to raise your children. You have to help your children be better. Your children aren't gonna always do the right thing. They're not gonna always make the right decisions. So sometimes you have to, oftentimes you have to criticize them, you have to teach them, you have to guide them in the right direction. And a lot of times they're gonna not like you for it. A lot of times they're gonna think you're being nitpicky. A lot of times they're gonna think that you're being extra. A lot of times they're, 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 they're not going to agree with you constantly picking at them or telling them to do this or do that or do this, or do that. Then when they get older, <clears throat> just like maybe it happened with you and now you're single with it, when they get older, they're going to think back and realize, oh man, I'm really glad that my mom or my dad or whoever was constantly criticizing me to an extent, right? It has to be balanced, right? But criticize me or made sure that I did the right thing or was telling me, hey, don't do this. Hey, don't do that. Make sure you do this. Make sure, because now it has helped me become better. Now I'm a healthier person in this way. So you're not called to be an uncritical lover nor an unloving critic. And that's with children. That's with a romantic partner. That's with something that you care about, an institution that you care about, a church, um, a school, your country, anything that you care about there is a certain level of criticism. There is a certain level of a critical eye that you must apply to it to say, hey, if I care about this thing, I want to see it be better. I want to see it grow. If it has done something wrong, I want to say you've done something wrong, let's fix it so that you can be better. Think about that with a romantic partner. Hopefully you don't want somebody that's just gonna say, hey, everything you do is right and nothing you do is wrong all the time. You don't want, you. I don't think you would want that. But you want somebody who's going to help you be better. And so when we say you can't be an uncritical lover, you can't love somebody without criticizing them. You can't love somebody without checking them. Nor can you, nor should you be an unloving critic. That means if you do criticize somebody, you have to criticize them out of love. If you're constantly telling them you're bad, you're bad, no, 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 all the time, and there's no love in how you do it, then that can also be bad. So even when you are correcting someone or correcting an institution, it should be out of love. They may not like it, but they should see that this person is doing this so that they can see me be better. And if you do that with a romantic partner, oftentimes that makes the romantic relationship grow. If you do that with your children, uh, at the time they may not like it, but then later they may realize, oh wow, mommy loves me, daddy loves me, whatever, right? And even when you do that with institutions, you can see that it is out of a love and it helps that institution grow. 
And so that is what critical race, that is a part of what critical race theory is. It is a harsh look. It is a harsh critique on the issues, the traditional and contemporary issues of race and racism in the United States. It is not there to do all of the things that we talked about in the assumptions, but it is there to be num uh, in, in many ways to be a voice for the lived realities of minority people to give a much more um, um, accurate understanding of their experiences and say, this is what race and racism has done to these people. This is how it exists in their reality. This is what it means to them. This is what it has done to their true, um, um, to their parents and grandparents. And this is what it does now. And it holds that mirror up. One of the many theories that holds that mirror up to the country to say, hey, these are the issues around race and racism in the United States. And through this prism, you see a, a different and in many ways, a much more accurate, uh, um, you see a much more accurate display of the details and, and, and um, of the details and the very broad as well as minute ways in which race plays out. Both on a collective level, on a structural level, as well as on an individual level. And so critical race theory gives us these principles and these theories that can generate racial, additional racial concepts of particular times and on the in in on these social contexts, right? Because under critical race theory, we're going to talk about this in a second. You will also see other theories that kind of come out of that. You'll see black black feminist thought. And you'll see systemic racism. You'll see colorblind racism. You'll see intersectionality. You'll see all of these other principles and theories kind of coming out of this larger conversation of critical race theory. So when people want to attack critical race theory. Well, doing that, you attack a lot of other things that you may, that will, well, that will essentially silence the discussion on the importance of race to a, a, a broad range of people. It is out of critical race theory that you have the studies on whiteness, white fragility. That comes out of the conversations on critical race theory. And along with class and gender, it completes the main set of three oppressed social groups. Race, class, and gender. So critical race theory, um, that is kind of, that gives you kind of a broad understanding of, uh, of what it is. So now let's go to historically what critical race theory um, was so let's so let's let's go back to in your mind um, let's go back to the civil rights movement right so what you have is you have the civil rights movement that came out uh, not that came out but that existed in the 1950s and then and around the 1960s is when you start to see the victories of this of 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 of, of this movement you know usually it takes about a decade um, that's when you start to see it, it kicks off around 54, maybe 53 with the Brown V, with the um, Montgomery bus boycott. And then that the victory comes in 54 with the Brown V Board of Education or um, what was the victory? I think it was in 54 with the Brown V Board. Um, I, might, I might be getting these years wrong. I know all of this is in the mid fifties. Brown V Board, I believe is in 54. Um, the Montgomery bus boycott that might have been in '55, I think, somewhere around there. <laughs> I need to go back and look at my um, um, my notes. But you have around the mid '50s is when you have the Montgomery bus boycott, which kicks off the civil rights movement, and the Brown v. Board of Education, which is really the first main legal victory of the civil rights movement. 
So now you're starting to see more and more smaller victories on the state level of desegregation. You don't really get another major victory with the civil rights movement until the 19, um, well, you have the 1963 March on Washington where Dr. King gave his I Have a Dream speech. That then leads to the 1964 um, Civil Rights Bill, right? Then after that, it just keeps going. 1965 Voting Rights Act, 1968 um, Housing Act, right? So you have all of these acts that are not that are now showing the victories of the civil rights movement. Um, after um, um, Dr. King is murdered in Memphis, Tennessee, you start to see where the victories and um, you start to see where what had occurred in the civil rights movement is starting to kind of come into fruition, especially in mainstream America. Late 60s, early 70s, this is when you start to get the first um, black this and the first black that. So Bill Cosby was the first black, you know, I think major uh, star um, um, person in like a, a, a major film or something like that, I can't remember. Uh, but folks like Bill Cosby, Sidney Poitier, this is when you start to see black professors integrating into academia. This is when you start to see more black teachers coming and also or teaching in white schools. This is when you start to see your first black everything, right? The first black this, first black that, first black astronaut, first black whatever, right? You start to see this more. And from the outside looking in on a popular level, it looks as though there's now been some success. Well, now we see black people everywhere and they're in prominent positions. So it looks like there has been some progress. It looks like America has now done what it was supposed to do in ensuring that everybody had the opportunities necessary to be successful. And what law students were being taught at this time was that the reason why this occurred was because of the law. These students would go to law school, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, UCLA, and they were taught that the law was the great equalizer. Yes, there's racism. Yes, there's classism. Yes, there's inequality. We can't change everybody. That's just what it is. But if you can get your case in front of the law, the law doesn't see color. The law is colorblind. The law is going to tell you, boom, this is what the law says. No matter what, the documents in this country are not racist. The documents in this country was put in place for everybody. Yes, there were things that were happening while they were making these documents, but the documents and the words in and of itself are not racist. All people are created equal. These laws that we create are created for everybody, regardless of their race. So if you can get in front of a judge, you can get in front of a lawyer, if you can get in a courtroom and you can have your case heard, the law is gonna balance everything out and give everybody the opportunity to ensure that they can advance in a fair and equal and just way. So that is what law students were being taught in the 70s. Well, you have folks like Kimberly Crenshaw and Derek Bell and Richard Delgado and many other law students of color who are saying, mm, I don't think so. That don't sound right. Because they're coming from communities. They're coming from families where they're saying, no, my cousin was just <laughs> in front of the front of the judge. And he was clearly racist and lawyer and a bailiff. We, we've seen how the law has not worked in our favor over and over and over again. We're not removed from this. So even though we have the opportunity to go to law school, either our experiences or the experiences of our fathers or our mothers or our cousins or our brothers and sisters, no, this, this isn't right, what we're being taught. But what they did was they moved through law school, they got their degrees, 
they got their letters, they got their positions, key positions in various universities. And they said, now we need to change the discourse. We need to change the way of this way of thinking. Because people that are, are leaving here are now going on to be big time lawyers and judges and attorneys and DAs, and they're thinking this way. And they're gonna use this thinking and use it to pass policy and use it to shape the way our society is functioning and governed. And it's gonna be functioning in a way that does not reflect the realities of people of color, particularly poor people of color, particularly black and Hispanic people, black and Latinx people. So we need to change the narrative. We need to change this discourse. And they started to publish papers and do research and, 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 and look at the various, schol um, the various scholarship, the various um, court cases, all the way from the 18th and 19th centuries on down to show that race and racism was very much a part of the legal process. And even more to show that race and racism made up the very fabric of what the United States was and still is. And while there was yes, some movement and some opportunities available for a certain group of African-Americans post the civil rights movement, particularly middle-class African-Americans, the vast majority of black folks could not participate in this privilege, because they didn't have, many of them didn't have the class status to be able to do it. But then not only that, much of the issues around race and racism still existed. And, did, did, and their, 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 their money did not give them as, access to the best lawyers, to, the, to you know, mom and dad being golf buddies with the judge that could help get them off of some case or whatever. They didn't have the social status for that. So they knew that what they were being taught was not true. And they spent the 1970s and the 1980s creating legal scholarship that came to be known as critical race theory. And it was out of critical race theory that we started to have a much more accurate jargon around the issue of race and racism in this country. And then these, and then this, 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 this scholarship started to get applied to other disciplines and other parts of academia, particularly sociology and political science and education. And so now you, now you can find critical race theory on pretty much in, in any discipline. Critical race theory is somewhere in that discourse. Find critical race theory papers in sociology, critical race theory papers in, in history, critical race theory papers in psychology, definitely in education, th thanks to Gloria Lanson Billings. You find it everywhere. And so it's important for us to know, well, what is critical race theory? What, what, what are some of the basic tenets? So again, it's hard to say everything around critical race theory, because there's so many different papers. Thousands and thousands of papers will probably show up about critical race theory. So I'm not going to tell you every single dynamic, every single element of critical race theory. But what I can do is give you some of the basic tenets. Some of the basic tenets around critical race theory is number one, it recognizes that racism is ingrained in the very fabric and the system of American society, meaning that we cannot talk about the history of America. We cannot talk about the history of the United States and not talk about race and racism. You can't, or you can, but you're leaving out a very key part and essentially you're desensitizing the story of this country. Nobody's perfect. No country is perfect. Very few countries have done what the United States have done, just being honest. Um, but nobody, no country is perfect. Every country is going to have flaws and have parts of their history that they're ashamed of. United States is no different. But you have to talk about it. And you have to talk about it in a real way. 
And there are some things that are unique to the United States in terms of how egregious this level of oppression really was. Those things can't be denied. Well, you can try to deny it, but it doesn't mean that it didn't exist. So critical race theory says that racism is, it's, it's a part of the fabric of the country. It was how it was founded. That's why many people don't agree with Columbus Day because of how the Native Americans were treated. If you talk about the people who built these bridges, who built the White House, where the president stays, these people were enslaved Africans. When you talk about the people, all this stuff we talked about in, in the book Racist America, when you talk about the people that actually wrote the Declaration of Independence and, and, and wrote the Constitution, these people participated in slavery, owned Black people. There are documents, there are, 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 are amendments in place that specifically say that Black people are three-fifths of a human being, and it's a part of the making, the fabric of the country, and that's just the political part. We haven't gone into banking. We haven't gone into the medical industry. We, I mean, it's, it's, it's there. Way too many books on it. So racism is a part of the U.S. It's part of U.S. history. It's a part of the racist, found, part of the foundation of the country. Person can deny it. They cannot deny it, but it doesn't mean it's not true. The individual races, this is the second tenet, the individual races need not exist to note that institutional racism is pervasive in the dominant culture. Meaning, just because a singular person is not racist does not necessarily mean that the rest of society is not, or that institutions are not. There was a time where many people believe, James Baldwin particularly, if we can just change the minds of the people, even Dr. King, to, to an extent, felt this way. If we can just change the minds of the people, help people see that this is wrong, help people um, um, come into a better understanding about oppression, about racism, about sexism. If we can just change the minds of the people, these are the people that run the institutions, then things will get better. What critical race theory says is no. Because for a long time, many people felt, well, if the old generation dies off, the new generation will be better. If the slave, if these so-called slave masters die off, their kids who didn't agree with what these so-called slave masters did, they're going to make life better. But that's not what happened. Because after that, you have Jim Crow. Okay, well, if that generation of Jim Crow dies off, then this next group is going to make things better. Well, no, not necessarily, because now you have lynching. Now you have um, um, mass incarceration, all right? Now you have the Southern strategy of the 1970s. Okay, okay, well, if that group dies off, then, so every generation we're trying to figure out, okay, well, the next generation is gonna make it better. No, and even if they did, it's not necessarily in the person, for the people, it's in the institutions. The way in which these institutions are built are racist at their core. The way in which um, our education system is set up is racist at its core. The way in which our political system, our voting system, our criminal justice system, our, um, 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 the system for home loans, all of it is set up with a racist foundation. So if you could magically snap your fingers and everybody in the, in the country is not racist anymore by magic, what this tenant says is that you will still be dealing with the same issues because the institutions are still racist, because their practices are still racist. And, 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 and the principles that have run these institutions for years and decades and even centuries, that's what it functions off of. So then you have to come up with a plan to change the institutions at its core. And we could talk about what people have said to provide a solution later. The third tenet 
is that power structures are based on white privilege and white supremacy, which perpetuates the marginalization of people of color. Seats of power, positions of power are there ultimately to help advance white people. And in the advancement of white people and white interests, it simultaneously, simultaneously reinforces the marginalization of people of color. It reinforces the continual hurdles that Black people, that Asian Americans, that Latinx people, that Native Americans have to go through. Power structures, whether deliberately or unconsciously, passes laws, puts traditions and puts practices in place that will make it easier for white people and make it more difficult for people of color. And that is the reason why we have diversity, equity, um, and inclusion initiatives. You, you see it all the time. Diversity and inclusion, diversity and inclusion, diversity and inclusion, diversity and inclusion. See it all the time. Why? Because institutions, power structures understand that tenet. They understand these things happen and many white people who run these institutions realize that this happens even on a, even if they don't mean to do it. Because race and racial bias and what protects our interests are kind of automatic. It's automatically in the way in which we do things in the United States, a part of US culture. So they say, well, I can't automatically change my culture, or automatically change what I would normally do in this situation. Let me bring a person from a minority group. Let me bring people from a minority group to help in this way, to help me make decisions that will be more equitable to help ensure that the policies that I'm creating are not perpetuating marginalization for people of color. That is one way that that is done. Now we can, there's a whole nother criticism around that. I don't wanna get, go too far off, but that is one way. Um, and then lastly, critical race theory rejects traditions of liberalism and meritocracy. Talks a little bit about that in colorblind racism. Meritocracy is something that the United States, and this is, this is the one that, that, that many opponents to critical race theory attack the most. Because meritocracy is a part of US culture. We believe, uh, um, um, US citizens believe, people who call themselves Americans believe, we left the British, we left that oppression over there. We don't have a caste system like they do in India, or like they did in South Africa and all these other places. We don't have this because we believe that if a person comes to these shores and they work hard and they're successful and they're honest, hardworking human beings, they can, be, they can achieve whatever they want. That is, that is how the United States uh, markets itself as the land of what? The land of opportunity for who? For all. And this was, this was a way or the, it, it marketed itself as unique to all these other countries. So you got people from all over the world saying, oh, if I just go to America, this is where I can become this is where I can, I have the option, I have the, 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 the possibility to be whatever I wanna be. And what critical race theory says is, uh, no, it attacks that. And this is a sensitive topic because again, when you're taught this for so long, all throughout kindergarten and elementary and middle school and high school, and then you get to college or you get to grad school and you got to take a class and they tell you, sorry, they told you wrong. 
and then provide all kinds of support as to why it's wrong can kind of challenge your convictions. It could shake up your faith a little bit. That the United States is not a country that is truly a meritocracy. People are not only successful based on their merits. We like to believe so, but it takes more than your merits to be successful. And we've talked about this before, when I said that even as a male, I have to realize that while I have worked hard to be in the position that I'm in, it's not only because I've made certain scores or I received certain degrees or I wrote certain things, it was also that I had a certain male privilege that allowed me, allowed people to give me options or allowed things to be easier for me than it was for some of my women colleagues. And I'm sensitive to that and I understand that. Can I change that? No, well, yes, I can. I can be part of the change. But I can also recognize that this does exist. And what meritocracy says is that there is a such thing as racial privilege. There is a such thing as male privilege. There is a such thing as white privilege. There is a such thing as class privilege. When you are part of certain social categories and social identities, things are easier for you than it is for somebody else. Critical race theory rejects liberalism to say that the United States is a country that is equal for all. If you've ever seen West Side Story, either the new one that, that, that just came out or the old one, it kind of deals with this topic. Critical race theory holds that mirror up to the country to say, no, what you're teaching is not necessary, is not a is not a reflection of the of the experiences of people of color, especially black people in this country. Because even Du Bois shows us that even the, the middle class African Americans, even the African Americans that have money, still come into contact with a lot of issues that their poor or working class counterparts have to run in, run into. Even the ones that are extremely successful. And there's so many examples, just one, Serena Williams. Serena Williams is a phenomenal tennis player, millions and millions of dollars and have whatever she wants is whatever, respected all over the world. When she got ready to have her child, she almost died. She almost died having her child. Why? Because she told the doctor something was wrong with her body and the doctor did not believe her. And that is a part of a longer tradition of racism in the medical industry. If you read Killing the Black Body, that was written back in the 90s. Forgot the lady's name. I always forget these. Oh, I'm so bad with names. Uh, but you can just Google killing the black body. If you Google medical apartheid, I remember her name, Harriet Washington, talks about the way in which black people, particularly black women, have been discriminated against. When they say something is wrong with them, they're not believed because historically, black it, it's been taught to white doctors, particularly white male doctors, that black people can withstand pain better than white people. So anytime a black person claims that they're going through pain, doctors don't believe them and allow it to happen and then the situation gets worse. It happened with Serena Williams. She said something was wrong with her body. The doctors told her it was nothing. The doctors didn't believe her. She almost died. She advocated for herself and she got the care that she needed. Somebody did die, P. Diddy. You may know P. Diddy, Puff Daddy, Sean Combs, whatever, hip hop mogul. The, the mother of his children did die. Even after she told the doctors that something was wrong with her and they did not believe her and now she's not living. And these people had access, abundant access to money, resources, the best, everything. But because of what? Because of race. They either almost died or they did die. So there is no such thing as true meritocracy in the United States. And that is what critical race theory says. The lived realities of people of color, of black people, particularly black people in this country shows that 
the way in which white people live is not the same way in which black people live. It's not the same way in which other people of color live. All right, so Kimberly Crenshaw uh, was a part again of this group. Um, and so I want you to click on this link and just kind of get directly from her what critical race theory is. Get it directly from her. Um, just a quick uh, explanation of it. And then um, we'll go into the next part of this conversation. All right, so just real quick, I know we've spent a lot of time talking about talking about this first part. Um, so I wanna go through some things that'll kind of help this, this kind of stick a little, a little bit more. What are the purposes of critical race theory? Number one is to advance social justice ideas. So it is, it is, it is there to kind of help us understand um, the lived realities of people of color, and they help us create ideas that provide uh, justice for all people, right? It is aimed to even out social inequalities. So it is there to help us push forth notions around affirmative action, around diversity, equity, and inclusion um, efforts. It is there to help us um, help us figure out the various inequalities that exist in our society, and then how can we make these things more equal? Um, study the intersections between different groups of minorities. So just because we talk about race, what we end up finding out through critical race theory, that there were some problems in critical race theory. We'll talk about that a little bit more later, but what the black women started to realize is they're creating this theory is that, well, we are talking a lot about black men, but what about women's experiences? Black women have a unique experience that black men don't have. And there's a such thing as male privilege too. We can't let critical race theory reinforce sexism. So then you start to get intersectionality. Now you start to get black feminist thought. And then out of black feminist thought, you have other ideas around feminist thought, Latina feminist thought, Asian American feminist thought, Asian American sexual politics, right? Now you have all of these other groups that can now have their own discourse because of intersectionality that came out of what? Critical race theory. So now we can look at how all of, all of these groups are specific. Then you have a uh, queer theory and queer theory. I don't think we talk about queer theory here. I know we talked about it in my other class, but queer theory is like queer theory, but for black people. And how particularly sexuality and ideas around how queer, particularly black queer people experience sexual oppression, racial oppression, gender depression. All right. Um, and then critical race theory studies the significance of mass media and popular culture in the distribution of power and the perception of minorities. So it looks at how does the mass media, how does Hollywood, how does um, music, how does um, advertisements, how do they play a role in reinforcing these, these various power dynamics, right, that exist in our society, reinforcing the white supremacy standards that exist in our society, and help to remove power from minority communities and continue to place it in the, in the power of the so-called majority. And so some of the questions that we focus on in this next slide that we focus on when we are discussing critical race theory is number one, whatever it is that we're looking at, whether it's an advertisement, whether it's a song, whether it's a, a, a political speech, whatever, first thing we ask, is this good for people of color? We don't say color people. I've seen, I've seen on so many papers, I've heard many people, all white students uh, or white people say colored people. That's not the correct term. It is a pejorative. Some people say, oh, well, it's not the N word. It doesn't matter. It still makes a lot of people of color, particularly black people, feels almost like the N word. So don't say colored people, people of color. That is a much more accepted term. You know, you still might find some people who don't like that term either, but it's much more accepted than colored people. 
So is this good for people of color? How does this portray people of color? If we're looking at a, an advertisement, if we're looking at a law, particularly a law, a law that gets passed. Is this good for people of color? What implications does it have for, for them? How does this portray us? What is it saying about us? What conclusions seem to be made about people of color with this law, with this show, or with this advertisement, or with this whatever? And then what intersectionalities, what does it say about not only race, but gender and class and ethnicity and sexuality? What what does this law, what does this policy, what does this um, speech, what does this show, what does this advertisement say about all of these intersectional identities within the minority group? So these are the things that critical race theory says that we have to focus on, right? So let's try it out. Let's take a look at this advertisement from the 1920s to the right. Let's take a look at this advertisement. Um, and you see, it says Piccaninny, which already, I mean, <laughs> very, very racist term. Piccaninny, you see this black person, looks like a black kid with hair sticking up, these big, red lips and white eyes with a watermelon. And already we can start to use critical race theory to analyze this. This was a popular advertisement or maybe not a popular one, but this was an advertisement in magazines and newspapers in the 1920s. So let's use some of these questions around critical race theory to analyze this. Is this good for people of color? Doesn't feel like it. Maybe a white person might look at this and say, I don't really see anything wrong. We're not saying anything bad. But if you ask, a, that's just, this is why diversity and equity and inclusion is important. Because if you were to ask a black person, now, definitely how they feel, they'll be angry. But even at that time, if they were at the table before you even printed this out, they would have said this, I promise you, this is not going to make our people feel good there's gonna be some protests. They're not gonna like this because I don't like this when I see this. And not to say that every black person, every person of color is not is like me, but I can guarantee you if I don't like it, a bunch of other ones ain't gonna like it either. So we already see this does not feel good for people of color. How does this portray people of color? Now we're getting to the nitty gritty of this thing. How is this portraying us? It makes us look bad. It makes us look, look um, 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 ignorant, infantile. We have this black baby, ah, oh, yay, watermelon, right? It makes us look poor with the so-called nappy hair. It makes us look entertaining. as if somebody is watching this and they're laughing, not necessarily laughing at the content that's written, but laughing at this black kid. What conclusions seem to be made about people of color? And the conclusions seem to be that they're these, this, this infantile group, they're ignorant, they're young, they're, they're pansies, they're, um, they love watermelon, they, um, all they do is is laugh and 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 play and eat and that's it. It does not present black people in a positive light. It does not present them in a way that white people may be presented in an advertisement. And then, what intersectionalities, race, gender, class, can you find, and what do they mean? Well. Um, not a whole, whole lot. May I don't, it looks like this is probably a girl because has a bow in her head. Definitely the girl looks poor. Right. 
but happy because, wow, they have a watermelon. It almost makes it seem as though if you just give Black people a little watermelon, they'll be fine. If you just give them a little bone, if you just give them a, just give them one little policy, give them a holiday, they'll be fine. They'll leave you alone. As if the race is just pets or dogs or something that you can just kind of move along like a child. Just give them a little watermelon, move them along. And so there are all of these implications in this advertisement that when we use a critical race lens, we start to see this is not as, this is not as um, um, careless, this is not as harmless as we may think it is. Okay, um, let's go to another example. So a person might say, well, that was back in the 20s. We know people were racist back then. Well, let's go to a more modern example. Take a look at a more recent advertisement. I want you to click on this link and it's gonna send you to an advertisement. And it's, it, it's not, um, it, it's a person of color, people of color, but they're not black. And I want you to look at this advertisement and I want you to, and then come back and then we're gonna talk about use the, the critical race theory focus questions to answer this question to, 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 or to find out more about how we can see using a critical race lens if this is something positive or negative for people of color. All right, so now that you've seen that, tell me, is this advertisement good for people of color? Is this good for people of color? Already, we can already see, no, it doesn't look like it is, right? Well, how does this portray people of color? So people of color are portrayed in a way where they are seen as ugly. Or if I am a person of color, I cannot be successful. Young lady, she, was a, a little, she wasn't even that dark, but she was darker and she couldn't get a job and she wasn't seen as beautiful and her parents, her dad didn't, you know, was, you know, didn't smile. But after she lightened her skin, she was more beautiful and the lights came on and her hair, flowed and she got the job and her parents were happy. It makes looking like a person of color, having a darker skin, feel ugly, feel bad. Feel as if things are better if I'm lighter skinned. What conclusions seem to be made about people of color? People of color will not be successful or cannot be successful are not as pretty. That's the conclusion that's made in this clip. What intersectionalities uh, uh, do we see in this? Obviously there's race and gender, particularly women of color will not be accepted as much, particularly around uh, having a partner someone who may want to marry them. It's hard enough for women to get jobs in certain um, industries, particularly a, 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 a woman who is darker skinned, it's even more difficult for her. Sexuality, she's much prettier if she's lighter skinned, if she has the straight hair has more Euro, European characteristics. And so these are the ideas and these are the parts 
of intersectionality that we see in this advertisement. And it's interesting because this advertisement is not even in English, but we can still see how racism transcends the US context. We can see how racism is still bigger than what we see in the United States. Racism is a global issue, particularly around colorism and white interests and white superiority. And so we see that right here in this advertisement. So what I would like for you to do is I would like for you to be a part of the discussion board called Critical Race Theory. And you are required to engage in the discussion board entitled Critical Race Theory. You're gonna follow, answer the following questions that are below, it's on the second bullet. Um, and before you do that, you could just, you can if you want, or if you already know about it, just do a quick Google search on the ban of critical race theory in public schools, uh, particularly in Florida. Particularly in Florida. What are some of your thoughts on critical race theory? And just in general, and these are, and these are the things I want you to answer in your posts. What are some of your thoughts uh, on critical race theory and its possible ban in Florida schools? What are some of your thoughts on it? Do you feel politicians should have control over what and how teachers instruct students in public and private schools? If so, how do you feel legislation should control the teaching of critical race theory? And how might controlling the way history is taught in K-12 schools later affect college learning? Because currently the, 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 the ban on critical race theory is for public and private schools K-12, mm -hmm. but it's not for, or it's this proposed ban, it's not for uh, colleges. Colleges have a certain certain history in colleges that allow for critical thought. Which is another thing about critical race theory that I didn't talk about. Critical race theory was, was first put in place just for law students. It never was intended to apply to students on the K through 12 level. It doesn't mean they didn't want it to. It's just the, their thinking was, we're gonna do this for law students. They didn't know that it would apply to eventually apply to all disciplines. They didn't know it would become as big as it was. And they didn't know that these ideas would be, even be taught on the K-12 level. I'm sure they're probably not bad at it, but that's not what it was intended for. It wasn't necessarily even intended for sociologists. They were just thinking about their discipline, the, the, the discipline of the law. And Kimberly Crenshaw has said that. So I want you to use information from the lecture or readings to explain your responses. And all instructions related to discussion board posts, which you can find on, on your, um, what you call it, on your syllabus uh, should be fulfilled before 11.59 p.m. on February 11th. So again, as always, you have until Friday. All right, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me um, and I'll be more than happy to answer them. Um, so it's out of, now we're gonna talk a little bit about what came out of critical race theory. So it's out of critical race theory that now you have these other theoretical ideas around race within the academic discourse. Systemic racism, and we've talked about that in detail, so I don't have to go over that again. Systemic racism, Black feminist thought. Black feminist thought is the idea that even when we're dealing with issues of race, we also have to make a separate path of analysis for women. 
of all races. But with this one, we're just talking about black women. And so black feminist thought is a separate discourse that deals with the unique ways in which black women have to navigate both sexism and racism. And it is out of this that we get intersectionality. It is out of this that we get intersectionality. And intersectionality looks at, and this is what Kimberly Crenshaw uh, 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 talks about. It is used to help us understand gender, race, class, and the many factors that play a role in the oppression faced by an individual. So we are made up of various identities. If you look at me, I'm not just an African-American. I'm not just black. I'm black. I'm a male. Some people may consider me middle class. I am a person from the South. I'm a person who some people may consider educated. So I have all of these different identities. Sexuality, I'm heterosexual. Gender, or I already said gender. Gender male, cisgender male. So all of these various identities. I was raised a Christian. Religion, uh, English speaker, that's another one. So many of them, right? So because of that, I'm not just one person. I'm a person that is made up of all these different identities. And all of these different identities come together to help illuminate my lived experience because I don't just function as a raced person, I don't just function as a black person, but being male, being of a certain class, being of a certain, all these different things make up who I am. And so you have to look at all of these things to help understand who is Professor Grant. And so intersectional feminism is a certain type of feminism that views women's identities as more than just women. So that means you can't pass a law about women and say, well, we're going to pass a law that makes things equal for women and then expect all women to be able to positively benefit from it. That's not the case. You have to look at them intersectionally. What benefits white women may not benefit black women. What, what benefits white and black, black women may not benefit a woman who is coming here from another country. What benefits those women may not benefit a lesbian woman or bisexual woman or transgender woman. All of the, we have to look at people intersectionally. It's extremely important. When we have this intersectional lens, then we can be able to understand the experiences and the needs and the desires and look at what is necessary for people to be successful and for people to be able to advance in this country in a fair and just and equitable way. Intersectionality also ensures that women are not left out or forgotten due to differences in race or religion or class or sexuality or ability level or, or all these other factors. Right? So all of these things, again, come out of the conversations around critical race theory. And uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. All right, so I think we are going to, I think we'll stop right there. I think that's a good place to go. 
And I think that's a good place to end. All right. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Um, inbox me. Uh, email me. My Zoom, I apologize for my Zoom hours. They've been off this week because I've I've been in a search meeting. So my apologies. That's why I've been trying to be better with my emails this week. Um, uh, so feel free to just email me and I will email you back. I've been having to keep my emails open because of being on this search committee. But this and next week should be the last week of, or this week actually, because y'all are seeing this this week. So this week should be the last week of that. And then I'll be back to my regular Zoom meetings after that. Um, uh, books, <laughs> a couple of people reached out to me. If you see essay, on your syllabus before the reading, or if you see G-R-A-R, -R, that's, your, that's your textbook. It says that in the syllabus, we talked about that on the first, in the first video. That's, that's where the reading is, okay? That's where the reading is. So make sure, I hope you have your textbook by now. Make sure you look at that. Um, and now if you don't see something in the textbook, or you don't see it in in Canvas, then feel free to reach out to me. Um, and then that just means I made a mistake. I didn't upload it or something like that. But those are the two places. Okay. Um, also, there's another lecture. So that was just a lecture on critical race theory. And then you'll close this uh, lecture and then you'll open up the next one and that will be over. Um, Native Americans and the power of language. So we're going to talk about all of that uh, and deal with all of that in that lecture and a couple other things we have. I have planned for that portion of this week. All right. With that being said, um, thank you for watching this. Thank you for engaging and uh, look forward to seeing you or you seeing me in office hours and in the next video. Have a great day, great week, and great weekend.